This episode of Weird Darkness is brought to you by The Option Line. Every 45 seconds, The Option Line receives a call from a woman dealing with a crisis pregnancy, and they need your help to make sure there's always someone there to reach out to. I'll tell you more at the end of the podcast, but you can learn more about The Option Line and what they do right now at WeirdDarkness.com slash hope. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash hope. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. Coming up in this episode of Weird Darkness, I've decided to be a bit selfish. One of my favorite authors for true crime and paranormal stories is Troy Taylor. He does his research, and when he takes pen to paper, he is unparalleled in creating a picture in your mind of the scene and the players. If you close your eyes, it's almost as if you were there when the events took place. Some of the work of Troy Taylor in this episode of Weird Darkness. So bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the Weird Darkness. According to newspaper and spiritualist accounts of 1874, some very strange things were happening on a small Vermont farm near the town of Chittenden. Allegedly, all manner of bizarre phenomena was said to be taking place in the home of William and Horatio Eddy, two middle-aged, illiterate brothers and their sister, Mary. The Eddies lived in an unkempt, two-story building that was reported to be infested with troops of supernatural beings in such numbers that had never been reported before or since. The events at the farm were said to be so powerful and so strange that people came from all over the world to witness them. Spiritualists began calling Chittenden the spirit capital of the universe. Needless to say, not everyone was convinced of the legitimacy of the reported events on the Eddy farm. One such man was a successful attorney named Henry Steele Olcott. Prior to hearing of the Eddy brothers, Olcott had no interest whatsoever in the burgeoning spiritualist movement. However, one day as he returned to his office from lunch, he picked up a copy of the spiritualist newspaper, Banner of Light. In the paper, he read a graphic account of the strange happenings that were being reported in Chittenden, Vermont. It's unlikely at that time that Olcott had any idea how a simple newspaper article was going to change his life. It's important that we establish the fact that Henry Olcott was not connected in any way to the spiritualist movement, nor was he a proponent of the paranormal. What might have prompted him to pick up a copy of Banner of Light that day is unknown. Olcott was born in New Jersey in 1832 and attended college in New York City studying agricultural science. While still in his early 20s, he received international recognition for his work on a model farm and for founding a school for agricultural students. During this same time, he published three scientific works. He went on to become the farm editor for Horace Greeley's New York Tribune. When the Civil War broke out, Alcott enlisted in the Union Army. He was appointed as a special investigator to root out corruption and fraud in military arsenals and shipyards. He was soon promoted to the rank of colonel, and after the war he was part of a three-person panel that investigated the assassination of President Lincoln. Alcott went on to study law and became a wealthy and successful attorney. So how would an agriculturist and military investigator go on to become one of the first American psychic researchers? After buying a copy of the spiritualist newspaper, Alcott read with interest the reports about the Eddy farm. Although skeptical, he knew that if the stories were true, this was the most important fact in modern physical science, he later wrote. A short time after reading the story, Colonel Alcott traveled to Vermont, 
accompanied by a newspaper artist named Alfred Capps. Together, they planned to investigate the strange events at the Eddy Farm, and if the stories were a hoax, they would expose the Eddy brothers in the Daily Graphic newspaper as nothing but charlatans. If the Eddies were true mediums, though, Alcott would announce the validity of spiritualism to the world. In either event, Alcott was determined to be fair and open-minded in his judgments. Alcott and Capps traveled to the secluded town of Chittenden in the Green Mountains. The trip out to the farm was uneventful, but the first meeting with the Eddy brothers was anything but ordinary. The two distant and unfriendly farmers were rough-hewn characters with dark hair and eyes, and New England accents so thick that the New York attorney and writer could scarcely understand them. Olcott would later learn that the brothers were descended from a long line of psychics. Mary Bradley, a distant relative, had been convicted of witchcraft at Salem in 1692. She had escaped the village with the help of friends. Their own grandmother had been blessed with the gift of second sight and often went into trances, speaking to entities that no one else could see. Their mother, Julia, had been known for frightening her neighbors with predictions and visions, although her husband, Zephaniah, condemned her powers as the work of the devil. Julia quickly learned to hide her gifts from the cruel and abusive husband. However, the supernatural could not be hidden once the couple began having children. Strange poundings began shaking the house, disembodied voices were heard in empty rooms, and occasionally the children even vanished from their cribs. They were likely to be discovered elsewhere in the house, or even outside. As William and Horatio got older, their strange powers strengthened. On many occasions, Zephaniah would see the boys playing with unfamiliar children who would disappear into thin air whenever he approached. When these visiting children vanished, he would take his boys to the barn and beat them with a rawhide whip as punishment. The strange children returned again and again, though, earning the young Eddie boys countless beatings. Eventually, they would grow to both fear and hate their own father. The boys soon learned they were unable to attend school. The initial attempts were marked by inexplicable happenings and disturbances as invisible hands threw books, levitated desks, and caused objects like rulers, inkwells, and slates to fly about the room. Zephaniah tried everything he could to stop the disturbances, although this mostly consisted of him beating and abusing the youngsters. The strange events continued, though. When he realized that he couldn't stop the weird antics, he grew furious. Each time the boys fell into a trance, he would berate and verbally abuse them. He would try to rouse them by pinching and slapping them until they were black and blue. Once, on the advice of a sympathetic church-going friend, he doused the boys with boiling water. When this didn't work, he allowed his friend to drop a red-hot coal into William's hand, hoping to exercise his devils. The boy never awakened from his trance, but he did bear a scar on his palm for the rest of his life. On occasion, the spirits would attempt to defend the boys, appearing in front of Zephaniah and driving him from the house. Needless to say, these eerie and frustrating happenings were more than the man could stand. So, tiring of the boys but realizing their money-making potential, he sold the Eddie brothers to a traveling showman, who for the next 14 years took them all over America, Canada, and Europe. The long series of performances can only be described as sadism run rampant. As part of the performance, their manager would bind and gag the boys and then would challenge audience members to try and awaken them from their trances. The cruelty inflicted by these audiences made their father's abuse look tame. The Eddies were locked into small, wooden boxes to see if they could escape, and hot wax was poured into their mouths to see if they could produce spirit voices when they were unable to talk. The skeptics poked, prodded, pinched, and punched the sleeping brothers, leaving them scarred and damaged for the rest of their lives. On several occasions, they were even stoned and shot at by angry mobs. William Eddy bore a number of bullet scars on his body. 
Infuriated mobs attacked them and their promoters for every reason except for the justifiable one of stopping further child abuse. Some of the protesters were religious fanatics, convinced the Eddies were in league with the devil, while others were skeptics who felt that they had been cheated out of their money and had watched a performance of trickery. They barely escaped from Danvers, Massachusetts with their lives. In Cleveland, an angry mob seized William Eddy and only a last-minute rescue saved him from the pain of hot tar and feathers. In some of the larger cities like New York and Philadelphia, they were safer from mobs but were still subjected to threats and indignities. In spite of all of this, the Eddies gave performances so sensational and so profitable that only the death of their father ended their tours and their suffering. They were finally allowed to return home. They moved on to their family farm with their sister Mary and opened the house as a modest inn called the Green Tavern. Unfortunately, by then the brothers were warped men, hostile and suspicious, trusting no one but each other. Colonel Alcott later described them as two men who could easily make newcomers feel ill at ease and unwelcome. As unsociable as they were, the Eddies rarely had a vacancy in their inn. They took in spiritualist boarders who flocked from all over America and Europe to take part in the seances that were held on every night but Sunday. The Eddies charged $10 per week for a room and board at the inn, which was high for the time, but not exorbitant. Overflow visitors found other lodging in Chittenden and neighboring homes, for though the Eddie house was large, it was unable to serve the huge number of visitors who gathered for the nightly seances. Colonel Alcott obtained a second-floor room and, like all of the visitors, was given the run of the house. Apparently, all but the most gullible guests used this freedom to search the premises, hoping or fearing to find theatrical props and assorted items that might aid in hoaxing those who came to see the seances. Where did the Eddies hide the mirrors, wires, and sheets? Where were the costumes they used in the hoax? Alcott prowled the house from cellar to attic, but was unsuccessful in finding anything to show the events were a fraud. On Alcott's first day at the farm, he was witness to an outdoor seance. In the bright moonlight of a warm summer evening, a group of ten participants traveled down a path and into a deep ravine. They assembled in front of a natural cave, formed by two large stones that had collapsed atop one another, forming a large arch. Alcott later learned that it was called Honto's Cave, in honor of the Native American spirit who often appeared there. Alcott suspiciously investigated the cave, but no exit could be found at the back of the rocks. He determined there was no way that anyone could slip in or out of the cave without being seen. Horatio Eddy acted as the medium for the seance. He sat on a camp stool under the arch and then was draped in a makeshift spirit cabinet formed by shawls and branches that had been cut from small saplings. As Horatio rested there, a gigantic man dressed as a Native American emerged from the darkness of the cave. While the medium addressed this spirit, someone cried out and pointed up toward the top of the cave. Standing there, silhouetted against the moon, was another gigantic Indian. To the right, a spectral female had materialized on a ledge. In all, ten such figures appeared during the seance. The last, the spirit of William White, the late editor of a spiritualist newspaper, emerged from within Horatio's cabinet. He was dressed in a black suit and white shirt and was supposedly recognizable to some who had read the newspaper and recognized him from his picture. He vanished at the same time the others did. Moments later, Horatio appeared from the cabinet and signaled that the seance was at an end. After the bizarre display was over, Alcott and Caps carefully searched the cave and the surrounding area for footprints in the soft earth they found no trace that anyone had been there. Alcott found the seance to be convincing, but was sure that he'd be able to more easily detect fraud within the controlled setting of the Eddy house. He and Caps thoroughly examined the large circle room which was located on the second floor of the farmhouse. He drew maps, charts, and diagrams and took numerous measurements, sure that he would find false panels 
secret doors or hidden passages. However, he found nothing out of the ordinary. He was determined not to give up, though, and he convinced the newspaper to hire men to come to Chittenden and examine the place. Using carpenters and engineers as consultants, another thorough search was conducted. The experts also found nothing out of the ordinary. After this, Alcott and Caps were finally convinced that the walls and floors were as solid as they seemed. Because of this, what Alcott witnessed during the nights that followed became even stranger. Each seance was basically the same. Six nights a week, visitors would assemble on rough wooden benches in the seance room. A platform was lit only by a kerosene lamp, recessed in a barrel. William Eddy, who acted as the primary medium, mounted the platform and entered a small cabinet. A few moments later, soft voices began to whisper in the distance. Often there would be singing, accompanied by spectral music. Musical instruments came to life and soared above the heads of the audience members, disembodied hands appeared, waving and touching the spectators, and odd lights and unexplained noises appeared and filled the air. Then the first spirit form emerged from the cabinet. They came one at a time, or in groups, numbering as many as twenty or thirty in an evening. Some were completely visible and seemed solid. Others were transparent and ethereal. Regardless, they awed the frightened spectators. The spirits ranged in size from over six feet to small – it's worth noting here that William Eddy was only five feet nine inches tall – most of the ghostly apparitions were elderly Yankees or Native Americans, but many other races and nationalities also appeared in costume, like Africans, Russians, Asians, and more. Where had they come from, Alcott wondered. He'd examined the spirit cabinet and platform and had found no trap doors, nor hidden passages. In fact, there was no room in the cabinet for anyone other than the medium himself. Alcott had studied the workings of stage magicians and fraudulent mediums, but could find none of their tricks present at the Eddy House. The apparitions not only appeared, but they also performed, sang, and chatted with the sitters. They produced spirit articles like musical instruments, clothing, and scarves. In all, nearly every type of supernatural phenomena was reported at the Eddy Farmhouse. These included wrappings, moving physical objects, spirit paintings, automatic writing, prophecy, speaking in tongues, healings, unseen voices, levitation, remote visions, teleportation, and more. And of course, the full-bodied manifestations of which Alcott observed more than 400 during the weeks he visited the house. He concluded that a show like that, which he had seen, would have required an entire company of actors and several trunks of costumes. Yet, Alcott's inspection of the premises revealed no place to hide either actors or props. The idea of stage actors was further dispelled by the convincing manner of the spirits. One woman spoke in Russian to the alleged spirit of her deceased husband. A number of other dialects were also heard. How was this possible when the Eddies could barely read and write and were scarcely capable of speaking coherent English? In addition, such an elaborate show would have cost a fortune to produce each night. They would have had to pay the actors, invest in costumes, and hire someone to create the marvels of the spirits. This would have been impossible given that the brothers were almost penniless. Most of the visitors who came to the farm did not pay, and the rooms only gained them $10 per week for room and board. No admission was ever charged for the seances. In Olcott's mind, fraud would have been physically and financially impossible. The investigator's ten-week stay on the Eddy farm was surely a test of endurance. He left disliking the house, the food, the weather, and the Eddy brothers themselves. However, he was convinced of the fact that the two men could make contact with the dead. The farm attracted many international visitors, but none of them was as flamboyant as Helena Petrovna Blavatsky, who arrived during the time of Colonel Olcott's investigation. Madame Blavatsky had not reached the height of her fame at this point, but she already commanded great respect in occult circles. 
She was a theatrical woman with a powerful personality and a flair for the dramatic, and she made an impression at the rural farm by smoking cigars and appearing in a variety of veils and flowing dresses. Many of the visitors in 1874 were already aware of Madame Blavatsky. She had been born in Russia in 1831 to German parents with excellent social credentials. She married young but later abandoned her husband to explore both the physical and spiritual worlds. She visited an odd assortment of places, such as Canada, Mexico, Texas, and India, and made a first attempt to enter the forbidden country of Tibet. A short time later, she vanished. For a decade between 1848 and 1858, Madame Blavatsky was not heard from, and she would often refer to this time as her veiled years. Her cloudy allusions to this time period were always vague and always intriguing. She may not have spent seven years at a mountain retreat in Tibet, but she truly did learn much of the Indian mysticism and acquired more than a dabbler's knowledge of the Jewish Kabbalah. From this learning, she would later piece together the novel religion of Theosophy, a curious mixture of many faiths and philosophies. Madame Blavatsky returned home to Russia in 1858 and began offering performances of spiritualism, mixed with overtones of the mystical East. She came to America and soon established herself as one of the best-known practicing mediums and occult teachers in the country. This is the reason why she made such a dramatic appearance when she came to Chittenden in 1874. She not only attended seances at the farm, but also volunteered to play appropriate music on the pedal organ that the brothers had recently acquired for the seance room. The Eddies were quick to latch on to her services. Everyone expected something marvelous to happen, and they were not disappointed. The group gathered that night in the seance room as Madame Blavatsky played the organ. William sat entranced in his cabinet as suddenly the curtains swept aside and a curious figure walked out. He was a tall, swarthy man who was costumed in velvet, decorated with gold braid, bedecked with tassels and wearing high leather boots. The man bowed, made gracious gestures of welcome, and then walked toward the observers with his hand pressed to his heart in greeting. Then, apparently from nowhere, a lance appeared in his empty hand. It was nearly ten feet long and decorated with what were said to be ostrich plumes. The man stomped across the platform, returned to its center, gave a military salute, and then began to melt in some sort of mist. The mist, or smoke, apparently emanated from the man's body and he gradually blended into the cloud and then disappeared. The crowd roared with both bewilderment and approval, but Madame Blavatsky regarded it all with equanimity. She was, after all, accustomed to oddities and was somewhat of a puzzle herself. Madame Blavatsky did not remain in Chittenden for long. In three years, she was to publish her acclaimed Isis Unveiled, the classic textbook of theosophy that would attract more than 100,000 followers around the world. Always drawn to India, she went to Madras in 1879, where she established the world headquarters of the Theosophical Society. She performed so many alleged miracles in India that an investigation was warranted by the Society for Psychical Research in 1884. The miracles collapsed under scrutiny, but her disciples rationalized that a few outward, even though questionable wonders, are necessary to draw the masses to the true inner faith. The anniversary of her death in 1891 is still remembered today and referred to as White Lotus Day. The Eddie's most famous guest left, and Colonel Alcott departed as well. Not only did he chronicle his visit in the newspaper, he also wrote a massive book called People from Other Worlds. The book, more than 500 pages long, is full of precise drawings of the apparitions, the grounds, the house, and even detailed plans of its construction, proving that no hidden passages existed. He also recorded over 400 different supernatural beings and collected hundreds of affidavits and scores of eyewitness testimony to the amazing events. He reproduced dozens of statements from respected tradesmen and carpenters who had examined the house for trickery. 
a modern reader would have to look really hard to discover anything that Alcott did not investigate. In spite of his careful attention to detail and impeccable credentials, many read this story today and are first inclined to dismiss the events as fanciful tales from another time. But the reputation of Colonel Alcott prohibits us from dismissing the story out of hand. His extensive documentation, along with his investigative skills, suggest that the events were not part of a hoax. Alcott remained skeptical and analytical throughout his ten-week stay at the farm, and yet he came away convinced that the Eddies had the power to contact and communicate with the dead. In short, Colonel Alcott came away from Chittenden a believer. He was so convinced that not only did he write his book, but he also helped Madame Blavatsky found the Theosophical Society. The once skeptical military investigator was convinced that the dead could and did communicate with the living. Eventually, the Eddy brothers and their sister Mary went their separate ways. Bickering and feuding had driven them apart. They began turning away the spiritualist borders and, except for a rare seance, lived off the farm and their savings. The glen at Honto's cave became overgrown, and the unhappy Eddies were more or less ignored by their neighbors. Horatio moved out and took a house across the road, where he took up light gardening, occasional seances and doing magic tricks for local children. Mary moved to the nearby village of East Pittsford, where she became a full-time professional medium. William dropped out of public life altogether and became a bitter recluse at the family farm. The first of the Eddies to die was Horatio on September 8, 1922. William lived for another ten years. He never married and refused to ever participate in spiritualism again. He died on October 25, 1932, at the age of 99. If either of the men had any secrets about the weird events at their home, they took them to their grave. So what really happened on the Eddy farm? In 1969, writer John Mason reported that almost no one living in the area of Chittenden was familiar with the Eddy brothers' strange story. A few local residents recalled stories told by their parents that led them to believe the whole thing had been a hoax, a fraud. And perhaps they were right, for just about everything about the story of the Eddy brothers seems to be worthy of serious questions. Too many of the events and details are reminiscent of well-known deceptions and the work of tricksters, who, unlike the Eddy brothers, were unmasked as frauds. But if the Eddy brothers were fakes, how did they do what they did? It would have taken trunk after trunk of costumes to stage the long-running spirit carnival in the second-floor seance room. Hundreds of colorfully garbed characters appeared at different times with elaborate headdresses, fancy props, uniforms, and plumed spears. Where were such things manufactured? How were they paid for? Where were they stored? There was no rapid transportation in those days, no nearby theatrical warehouses, and no place to hide the things once they were delivered. The dimensions of the spirit cabinet were limited, and it was impossible that anyone other than William Eddy and perhaps one other small person could have been concealed inside it. So where did all of the mysterious figures come from? There were no uses of clever light projection or mirrors, smoke machines, or easily detectable wires. No matter which way we turn, we are confronted with the choice between the impossible and the preposterous. Whatever you choose to believe, it can't be denied that something amazing and mysterious occurred on the farm of the Yeti brothers. Although what this may have been, we may never know for sure. Many more stories by Troy Taylor are coming up. If you're a loyal listener of Weird Darkness, I'd like to invite you to become an official weirdo. For as little as five bucks per month, you'll get the daily commercial-free version of Weird Darkness, exclusive news about the podcast, special offers only available to official weirdos, and even a lapel pin telling the world you are officially weird. You can learn about becoming an official weirdo at WeirdDarkness.com. And a huge thank you to one of our newest patrons, 
Sarah September 6th. That's the uh, name she decided to use on Patreon. Thank you very much, Sarah, for being a supporter of Weird Darkness. I really appreciate it. It's people like you that make this podcast possible. Hearing dark stories in a podcast is one thing, but living in darkness is quite another. If you're living with depression and trying to deal with it using alcohol, illegal drugs, or other bad influences, there is a way out of the dark. Call 1-800-273-8255. With the FMLA, you can even take a leave of absence from your job and return to it once you've found help. 1-800-273-8255. That's 1-800-273-8255. On June 8, 1908, an unmarried immigrant nurse named Sarah Coton finally had enough. After she lured the doctor that she worked for to an abandoned house, she shot and killed him. Never once did she believe that her actions were wrong. In the investigation that followed, it was discovered that her boss, Dr. Martin Nospitz, had raped her at work and she had become pregnant. When the police and courts refused to help her, she took matters into her own hands and carried out a sentence of death. Sarah's story became a national sensation. The press portrayed her as a powerless woman who had no other choice than to shoot her attacker. But Sarah saw things differently. She was an avenger who killed her attacker before he could hurt other women. When I thought of my broken life and the lives he might break, well, I felt it was my duty to kill him, she told a reporter but Sarah was soon on trial for her life. What would the courts decide? In 1907, Sarah Coton was working at a sanitarium in New York City. Like many staff members of the day, she also lived at the hospital. She was training to be a nurse under Dr. Martin Nospitz. He was bullying, aggressive, and threatening to her, but Sarah was determined to stick it out. Dr. Nospitz promised her that she would become a trained nurse if she stayed in his employ. I was frightened and did not want to stay, she later explained, but the doctor wanted me to stay. One morning, Ospitz broke into Sarah's room. He chloroformed her, and while she was unconscious, he raped her. The rape resulted in a pregnancy. When he found out that Sarah was pregnant, the doctor pressured her to have an abortion. Sarah refused and quit her job but struggled to find new work. She had immigrated from Russia in 1902, and now she was an unmarried pregnant woman with no means to support herself. In 1908, she took Ospitz to court. She brought a suit charging him with rape and demanding financial support for the unborn child. Ospitz denied the accusation and used his brother and brother-in-law to attack Sarah's reputation. They claimed she had a poor character, implying that she had seduced Ospitz and initiated a sexual relationship with him. The judge ruled in favor of the doctor and dismissed the case. Sarah then went to the police for help, but they turned her away. She then visited the district attorney, who told her that there was no legal recourse that could be taken against Sarah's rapist. That's when Sarah decided to, quote, be my own judge, unquote. On June 8th, she lured her rapist to the home of a pretend patient. When Ospitz arrived, she shot him through the heart. She didn't protest when the police took her away. Never did she proclaim her innocence. She simply stated that her actions had been justified. She had done it to protect other women. She was correct, at least as far as that went. Sarah had not been Ospitz's only victim. It was later discovered that Ospitz had a history of wronging women. Before Sarah killed him, at least two other women brought complaints against the doctor. One woman, Agnes Deffa, tried to attack Ospitz in court when he claimed that she had initiated a sexual relationship with him. The other woman, Anna Jensen, had been a patient at Ospitz's sanitarium. After Ospitz raped her, she burst into his office with a gun. She tried to shoot him, but the cartridge in her revolver failed to fire. This attempted murder happened only a few months before Ospitz raped Sarah. 
The police had been aware of the incident and yet still did nothing to help Sarah when she lodged her complaint against the doctor. As Sarah waited in prison for her trial, her case became a media sensation. At first, the stories were negative. She was called wretched, a frenzied girl, and a total wreck. The stories painted a picture of hysteria and criminality, an immigrant who was naturally a vicious killer. But all that changed after she gave birth to her son Abraham in prison. The newspaper now told a new story of a woman who must be innocent. Abraham was the proof of her story. The evil doctor had tried to pressure her to abort the baby and Sarah's refusal made her popular with the public. She was a model mother, they said, who was only defending her honor. Reports compared her case to the unwritten law that applied to gentlemen in the 19th century. If a woman's honor was at stake, gentlemen were allowed to retaliate, even if it violated the law. By the turn of the 20th century, that same law began to apply to women themselves. Women had little power to stop men's aggression and violence, the unwritten law argued, so it was acceptable for women to protect themselves in any way they could, even with a gun. At the end of Sarah's trial, Judge James A. Blanchard accepted her plea of insanity. He gave her a suspended sentence, sending her to the care of the Council of Jewish Women. Sarah's defense inspired other women. In early 1909, a woman named Elizabeth coerced Charles Schmidt into marrying her, saying if he didn't, she would, quote, blow out his brains like Sarah Coton did, unquote. Sarah Comiskey attempted to kill her father for abandoning his family. Nellie Walden killed her ex-boyfriend for running off. These women claimed they were inspired to violence because of Sarah Coton. As for Sarah herself, she walked out of prison after her trial and vanished from history. The Council for Jewish Women helped her to find a suitable home where she might change her name and rear her child in ignorance of the crime its mother had committed. The council concluded its statement on Sarah's case with this. While no one can consistently condone murder or any other offense against the law, it is gratifying to know that this suffering woman is not to be cast into prison for a crime that she primarily was not to blame for. On December 18, 1931, gangster and bootlegger Jack Legs Diamond was shot to death in a rooming house in Albany, New York. Diamond had already survived five attempts on his life between 1916 and 1931, causing him to be known as the Clay Pigeon of the underworld. In 1930, Dutch Schultz, an enemy of Diamond, remarked to his gang, "'Ain't there nobody that can shoot this guy so that he don't bounce back?' This time, Diamond didn't bounce back. Diamond, whose real name was John Moran, was born in Philadelphia on July 10, 1897. His parents, John and Sarah, were Irish immigrants. In 1889, a younger brother, Eddie, was born. The two boys struggled through grade school while their mother suffered from health problems. She died December 24, 1913, and their father moved them to Brooklyn soon after. Jack almost immediately fell in with some of the young street gangs of the era, notably the Boiler Gang. His first arrest for burglary occurred when he broke into a jewelry store on February 4, 1914. More than a dozen arrests would eventually follow. After a brief stint at a juvenile reformatory, he was drafted into the military during World War I. Not surprisingly, he deserted after less than a year and was sent to Leavenworth. When he got out of prison in 1921, he returned to New York, where he began associating with Charles Lucky Luciano, who was then a young but up-and-coming gangster. Diamond did odd jobs for Luciano, who introduced him to gambler Arnold Rothstein, who was the most powerful mobster in the city at that time. He eventually became Rothstein's personal bodyguard and was cut in on the new heroin racket, which was making a lot of money. Diamond, who had taken in his younger brother Eddie, was now making a lot of cash, and the brothers decided to start their own bootlegging business. 
It was a common practice at the time to hijack liquor shipments from other gangsters and then sell it, hurting the competition and making a huge profit. Unfortunately, the brothers decided to hijack truckloads that belonged to Owen the Killer Madden and Big Bill Dwyer, two of the most ruthless Irish mobsters in the city. They were also connected to a larger syndicate that was run by Dutch Schultz, Luciano, Meyer Lansky, and others. Once word got around that the hijackings had been carried out by the Diamonds, the brothers lost any protection they might have had and became targets for everyone. On October 24, 1924, Diamond was driving his Dodge sedan along Fifth Avenue and stopped at the intersection at 110th Street. A large black limousine pulled up next to him. A shotgun appeared from the back window and, according to witnesses, opened fire on Diamond. He ducked down and hit the gas. He drove an entire block without looking over the dashboard. When he did, he saw that the black car was gone. He drove himself to nearby Mount Sinai Hospital, where doctors removed shotgun pellets from his head and face. When the police questioned him, he shrugged the whole thing off. They must have thought he was someone else, he told them. It was obvious to Diamond that he needed protection, so he turned to Jacob Little Augie Organ, a Jewish gangster who had ran several rackets in Lower Manhattan. The main thing that he had going for him, as far as Diamond was concerned, was that he was one of the few people who didn't want to kill him. Organ wanted to increase his own power base so that he could compete with Luciano, Lansky, and the rest. Diamond would provide some of the muscle that he needed. Jack and Eddie became Organ's bodyguards, and in turn, Organ cut them in on his liquor and narcotics rackets. Then, on October 15, 1925, Organ and Diamond were finishing their daily meetings and collection rounds and were approaching the corner of Delancey and Norfolk Streets in Lower Manhattan. Three men approached them and started shooting. Organ was fatally wounded in the head and Diamond was hit twice on the right side. He was taken to Bellevue Hospital for emergency surgery and eventually recovered. He refused to tell the police anything, and they tried to charge him with murder but couldn't make anything stick. Organ's murder was never solved, although it was believed to have been arranged by Louis Lepke Buchalter and his partner Jacob Gura Shapiro. They wanted to take over Organ's rackets, and it's believed that Diamond may have been in on the plot. After he was released from the hospital, he took over Organ's liquor operation, while Buchalter and Shapiro took over the dead man's narcotics and other rackets. With cash now pouring in, Diamond became a regular on the nightclub circuit and his picture started showing up in the newspapers. He was never portrayed as a gangster, though, only as a wealthy man about town. The public loved him, and so did the ladies. Although married, he was a womanizer, and his best-known mistress was showgirl and dancer Marion Kiki Roberts. His flamboyant lifestyle kept him out at the clubs at night, and this may have been how he obtained the nickname Legs. He was a great dancer and was part owner of the Hotsy Totsy Club, a dance spot on Broadway. So the nickname could have come from this, or, as others have suggested, from his uncanny ability to escape death. On July 14, 1929, violence came to the Hotsy Totsy Club. Two brothers, Pete and William Red Cassidy, along with a friend named Simon Walker, started a fight at the club after bartenders and staff refused to serve the already drunk men. When a waiter told them to quiet down, Red turned on the waiter and began arguing with him. Walker grabbed club manager Jaime Cohen by the arm, demanded service, and threatened to destroy the club if they didn't get service. He then shoved Cohen to the floor. Diamond and one of his cronies, Charles Entretata, saw the exchange and stepped in. He told Walker, I'm Jack Diamond and I run this place. If you don't calm down, I'll blow your effing head off. Walker turned to Diamond and snarled, You can't push me around. Well, those turned out to be his final words. Diamond and Entretata both pulled their guns and shot Walker and the Cassidy brothers. Red was hit three times in the head once in the stomach, once in the groin. Walker was hit six times in the stomach. Both men were dead when they hit the floor. When the police arrived, Pete Cassidy was lying at the bottom of a flight of stairs with three gunshot wounds. Guns were found on all three of the men who had extensive arrest records. There were more than 50 people in the club when the incident took place. 
but no one saw a thing. Their backs were turned, they told detectives, or they were in the bathroom. Within six weeks of the shooting, Cohen, the waiter, two bartenders, and the club's hat check girl all disappeared. The waiter's bullet-ridden body was later found in New Jersey. No trace was ever located of the others. No witnesses ever came forward, so Diamond and Entretata were never charged. With the heat on him, though, Diamond closed down the club and moved to Greene County in upstate New York with his long-suffering wife, Alice. But he was only in Greece County for a short time before he sent word to New York that he was planning to return soon and reclaim what was his. When he'd left the city, Schultz and Madden had quickly taken over his rackets. His planned return made him an immediate target and earned him the moniker of Clay Pigeon of the Underworld. In 1930, while preparing for his move back to the city, but also while establishing a bootlegging operation in Greene County, Diamond and two others kidnapped Grover Parks, a truck driver who'd been hauling liquor. They wanted to know where he was picking up his alcohol shipments, but Parks refused to tell them. Oddly, they set him loose. A few months later, Diamond tried the same thing with another driver, James Parks, and this time he was arrested and charged with kidnapping. He was later acquitted at trial. In late August 1930, Diamond traveled to Europe. He told reporters that he was on his way to France where he would take a mineral water cure for his health. The real reason for the trip, though, was to establish a German liquor source. He was planning to smuggle alcohol from Europe to re-establish his New York operation. But nothing went according to plan. When the ship docked in Belgium, he was taken into custody by the police. After several hours of questioning, he was put on a train to Germany. When he arrived there, he was arrested by the German Secret Service who put him on a freighter that was bound for Philadelphia. It arrived on September 23rd, and he was immediately arrested by the Philadelphia police. At a court hearing on the same day, Diamond was told that he would be released if he left for New York within the hour. The weary gangster readily agreed. In New York, he moved into the Hotel Monticello in Manhattan and began trying to take back his rackets in the city. Hardly anyone was happy to have him back. On the morning of October 10, 1930, Diamond was wounded by three men who forced their way into his hotel suite and shot him five times. Still in his pajamas, he staggered out into the hall where he collapsed. He was rushed to Polyclinic Hospital, where he slowly recovered enough to be discharged on December 30th. When asked how he managed to make it to the hallway with five bullets in him, Diamond said he'd already had two shots of whiskey for breakfast. On April 21, 1931, Diamond was arrested again, this time on assault charges that dated back to the Parks beating in 1930. Two days later, he posted bond and was released. A week later, however, he was shot and wounded again. He was at a roadhouse called the Aratoga Inn near Cairo, New York, which was owned by Jimmy Wynn. Wynn had numerous underworld connections and the nightclub was a popular hangout for gangsters. Diamond had just finished eating with three companions and was waiting on a telephone call from his attorney. As he walked to the front door to get some fresh air, three gunmen who were dressed as duck hunters opened fire on him. Diamond was hit several times. A local man drove him to a hospital in Albany where he was treated for his injuries. His troubles continued. On May 1st, while he was still in the hospital, New York State troopers seized beer and liquor worth more than $5,000 from one of Diamond's hideouts in Cairo. He was charged with bootlegging and sentenced to four years in state prison. He appealed the conviction and remained free on bail while he awaited the outcome of the appeal. Meanwhile, Diamond still had to face the music in the Parks case, and later that year he went to trial. He was again acquitted on the assault and kidnapping charges. He left court a free man December 17, 1931. In the mood for a celebration, he and his family, along with a few friends, celebrated at the Rainbow Room of the Kenmore Hotel, the best hotel in Albany. At about 1 a.m. on December 18th, he left the party and went to see his mistress, Kiki Roberts, who was staying at another hotel. Roberts had attended the celebration party, but he had left before midnight. Diamond stayed in her room until about 4.30 a.m., and then was driven to 67 Dove Street, 
a private rooming house where he'd been staying during his trial. He entered the locked front door with his key, went upstairs to his room, and fell asleep on the bed. Witness reports say that a large black car, which had been parked down the street for some time, pulled up to the rooming house soon after Diamond arrived. Two men got out and entered the front door, using a key, and quickly went upstairs. When they got to Diamond's room, they either used a key or, as some believe, Diamond drunkenly left his own key in the lock and entered the room. Diamond was asleep on the bed. While one man held him down, the other shot Diamond three times in the head. They ran out of the room, but when they were halfway down the stairs, one of the gunmen ran back up, went back into Diamond's room, and shot him a few more times, apparently just for good measure. The landlady, Laura Woods, awakened by the shots, overheard the second gunman call out, ''Oh, hell, that's enough, come on!'' The man left the house and drove away in the black car. A few minutes later, at 5 a.m., Mrs. Woods telephoned Alice Diamond, the contact that Jack had given her in case there was any trouble. Within minutes, Alice, one of Diamond's men, and Diamond's eight-year-old nephew, Eddie, arrived at the house. Alice entered the room and began to scream. She frantically wiped blood from his face with a towel when the police and ambulance were called. Like most gangland slayings, the murder was never solved. In this case, there were just too many suspects since almost everyone seemed to want Diamond dead, from Dutch Schultz to the New York Syndicate, relatives of the Cassidy brothers who'd been shot at the Hotsi Totsi Club, and even local politicians who wanted Diamond out of the Albany area. It didn't seem to matter to most who had killed him. There weren't many who were going to miss him. Diamond was buried at Mount Olivet Cemetery in Queens on December 23rd. There was no church service or graveside ceremony. The burial was attended by Alice, her sister and brother-in-law, three nieces, a cousin, about a dozen reporters, and more than 200 curiosity seekers. There were no known gangsters in attendance, and, against the custom of the day, none of them sent flowers either. Diamond may have gotten what he deserved, but there was one sad footnote to the story. On July 1, 1933, Alice Diamond was found shot to death in her Brooklyn apartment. It was speculated that she was killed by her husband's enemies to keep her quiet, but no one knows for sure. Her murder, like the murder of Jack Legs Diamond, has never been solved. Keep listening, there's more Weird Darkness to come. If you love Weird Darkness, you might also love the Weird Darkness store. The newest design is perfect for you weirdos because it reads in big bold letters, proud to be a weirdo. You can get it on hoodies, mugs, tote bags, phone cases, pillows, and more. If you get a proud to be a weirdo classic t-shirt, it also comes with a giant Weird Darkness logo on the back. So you're spreading Weird Darkness wherever you go, coming or going. You can see all of the Weird Darkness merchandise and designs by clicking the store tab at WeirdDarkness.com. This episode of Weird Darkness is brought to you by MyPillow. Weirdo family member Mike said, Darren, I ordered two queen-size MyPillows and these really are, in a word, luxurious. The way your head and neck just sinks ever so comfortably into the pillow, it's so soft but at the same time so supportive. But right now, you can get two premium MyPillows for one low price. Go to MyPillow.com and use the promo code WEIRD or call 800-945-7192. That's 800-945-7192 or MyPillow.com, promo code WEIRD. On June 6, 1992, two Missouri teenagers and one teen's mother vanished without a trace after a graduation ceremony and have never been seen again. It was a shocking and tragic end to what should have been the event of a lifetime, and it remains a haunting, unsolved mystery to this day. Best friends Suzanne Susie Streeter, 19, and Stacy McCall, 18, had just graduated from Kickapoo High School. They were spending the evening celebrating with friends. 
They visited several different graduation parties and then decided to go to Susie's house, which she shared with her mother, Cheryl Levitt, a 47-year-old cosmetologist, for the rest of the night. Cheryl was probably happy to see them. Her night had been quiet. She'd been on the phone with a friend talking about painting furniture until about 11.15 p.m. What happened after that remains a chilling puzzle. Since all of Susie's and Stacy's belongings were later found at Cheryl's house – purses, clothing, makeup, etc. – it was assumed that they did make it there. Their cars were also in the driveway. But when friends arrived at the Levitt house the next morning, Susie, Stacy, and Cheryl were missing. A group of graduating friends all planned to go to the Whitewater Water Park the next day, so friends, Janelle and Kirby, came to the Levitt house at 8 a.m. on June 7th. They knocked, but there was no answer. They went home and then returned at noon, thinking that perhaps the two girls had left for the water park without them. As they approached the house, they saw that the porch light was broken. They swept up the glass, trying to be helpful, but unknowingly contaminated a crime scene. Janelle and Kirby checked the door. It was unlocked. That was their first inkling that something might be wrong. When they entered the house, though, everything seemed intact. There were no signs of a struggle. The house was just empty, as if they had simply walked away. But to where? The cars were all parked in the driveway, but Susie, Stacy, and Cheryl were nowhere to be found. Just before the two teenagers left, the telephone rang. Janelle answered. The caller didn't identify himself but began making lewd comments so Janelle hung up, assuming it was a prank call. She and Kirby left the house. A little while later, Stacy's mother, Janice McCall, arrived at the house. She had tried to call, but there was no answer, so she had driven over. She hadn't heard from her daughter since early the previous evening. There was no answer when she knocked, so she went inside. She looked around and found Stacy's belongings. Her daughter's underwear and T-shirt were missing, but the rest of her clothes were neatly folded on a chair. It looked like both girls had removed their makeup in the bathroom the night before. Janice also found all three of the missing women's purses lined up on the floor outside of Susie's room, which seemed odd. The television was on, and Janice saw that there was a message flashing on the answering machine. When she tried to listen to it, she accidentally deleted it. She was convinced that something was wrong, it had been 16 hours since the three women had been seen. Janice and her husband decided to contact the police. When the authorities arrived, they tried to nail down just how many people had been inside of the house, possibly contaminating the crime scene, and tried to figure out what had happened. It was a baffling situation, but suspects soon emerged. The first suspect was Cheryl's son, Bart Streeter, who had recently argued with his mother and sister about his drinking problem. But Bart had a solid alibi and was soon ruled out. Authorities also questioned Susie's ex-boyfriend, Dustin Reckla. He'd been in trouble before. A short time back, he and a friend were arrested for vandalizing cemeteries. Susie had given a statement to the police that stated the boys had been digging up graves and stealing gold teeth from the corpses. Threats had been made against Susie and her mother. When questioned, though, the boys were cooperative and also ruled out as suspects. The investigation then focused on Robert Craig Cox, an Army veteran who had been arrested and convicted of a woman's murder in Florida. The Florida case was overturned due to a lack of evidence. In 1985, Cox was convicted of two different abduction attempts and sentenced to nine years in prison. His case was appealed and overturned in 1992 when a judge ruled that the evidence only gave the suspicion of guilt rather than proof of it. He was released in 1992 and sent to live with his parents in Springfield, Missouri, which put him in the right place at the right time to have been potentially involved in the disappearance of the three women. Cox was working as an electrician, which the police speculated could have given him an excuse to enter the home. They also found that Cox had previously worked with Stacy's father at his car lot. Cox's girlfriend, gave him an alibi at the time, but years later she admitted that she lied about it. Cox had convinced her to make up the story if the police asked where he was during that weekend in June. Her story seemed solid, 
so the police had no choice but to let him go. But Cox found it impossible to stay out of trouble. A short time later, he was arrested again for an unrelated crime. Detectives still believed that he had something to do with the missing women and took the opportunity to question him again. Cox laughed at them. He said that he knew the women were dead and he claimed he knew where their bodies were buried, but was he telling the truth? The police didn't know. Cox loved attention, and this was the perfect way to get it. He was their most promising suspect, but he wouldn't talk, and they had no hard evidence against him. Eventually, the case went cold. The case of the Springfield Three officially remains open. Tips and stories have led to nothing but dead ends over the years. Theories abound. Some say they were victims of sex trafficking. Others claim they were carried off by a satanic cult. One tip, claiming that the women were buried in the foundation of a parking garage at a local hospital, was so convincing that the authorities tore up the concrete to look for them, and they found nothing. What happened that night in 1992? There was no sign of a struggle. The three women were simply gone. They were declared legally dead in 1997, but the questions that linger still weigh heavy on surviving family members and on detectives who refuse to close the case. Where are the Springfield Three? After all these years, no one knows. On June 5, 1930, the body of Chicago mobster Eugene Red McLaughlin was found floating in the Chicago River, despite the bailing wire that was wrapped around his body and the 75 pounds of metal that had been used to try and sink him to the bottom. The murder was actually one in a number of mob-related killings during what the Chicago papers called Slaughter Week. Like most mob hits of the Prohibition era, it was never officially solved. It had already been a rough year prior to the events of late May and early June. In January, a gun battle occurred in which Frank McCurlane, the mobster responsible for introducing the Tommy gun to Chicago, received partial payback for the murders of at least nine victims of gangland slayings that he was reportedly responsible for. Coroners had often listed him as a cause of death in autopsy reports. He'd been indicted for two murders a short time before, but charges were dismissed. McCurlane had been recently restless. He had fought over shares with his partner Joe Saltis and had transferred his allegiance to the South Side O'Donnells. During the ambush on January 28th, he was struck in the right leg by a bullet. While recovering at the German Deaconess Hospital, he had two unexpected visitors who walked into his room and opened fire. McCurlane, imprisoned by splints, did the best he could. He reached under his pillow and pulled out a 38 caliber revolver, which he fired five times. The intruders ran, leaving McCurlane still alive. Two full chambers had been fired at him, but McCurlane was only hit three times, and none of the wounds were fatal. He was interviewed by the police, but of course did not name his attackers. He did, however, hint angrily that this would not be the end of the matter. One of the gunmen had been John Dingbat Oberta, a ferocious little man who was the chief gunman for McCurlane's old partner, Saltis. On March 5th, Alberta and his driver, Sam Malega, were taken for a ride in Dingbat's own Lincoln sedan. He was shotgunned to death. Alberta's funeral was a two-day wake, attended by 15,000 admirers from the back of the yard's neighborhood on the south side where Alberta had earned a name for himself as an influential young politician. Dingbat's widow had previously been the wife of Big Tim Murphy, the racketeer controller of the Street Sweepers Union who'd been machine-gunned in front of his Rogers Park home in June 1928. She and Alberta had met at Murphy's funeral. She had her second husband buried next to her first husband in Holy Sepulchre Cemetery. She told reporters they were both good men. Then, in the last week of May 1930, the guns roared again kicking off what some news scribblers dubbed Slaughter Week. On Saturday, Peter Nolfo, who had once worked for the defunct Genna operation, 
and switched his allegiance to Joe Aiello, was shotgunned by the Druggan Lake Gang, allegedly on orders from Al Capone. Within hours, the Aiellos struck back and three died in the reprisal. A party of five was sitting on the terrace of a small resort hotel in Piscatee Lake during the early hours of Sunday morning. They were Joseph Bircha, who since being released from the Atlanta Penitentiary had been working for the Druggan Lake mob, Michael Quirk, a labor racketeer and beer runner, George Druggan, Terry Druggan's brother, Sam Peller, an election strong-arm man from the 20th Ward, and Mrs. Vivian McGinnis, the wife of a Chicago lawyer. A full drum of machine gun bullets shattered the glass and slaughtered the group at the table. Peller, Quirk, and Bircha died on the spot. Druggan and Mrs. McGinnis were both injured. The assailants vanished into the darkness. No arrest was made, and newspapers explained the attack as a quarrel that had developed because some of the Druggan Lake boys were muscling in on the Fox Lake area, which was then supplied by Aiello and Moran breweries. The reprisals continued, and on Tuesday, Thomas Somnario, an Aiello man, was found dead in an alley at the rear of 831 West Harrison Street in Chicago. He had been garroted, and his wrists were tied with wire. He appeared to have been tortured for information. Four days later, a tugboat passing along the drainage canal at Summit on the southwest side bumped into the body of Eugene Red McLaughlin, a drug and lake gunman who'd been named four times as a murderer and twice as a diamond thief and yet had never seen the inside of a prison. He'd been shot twice in the head and dumped in the river. His wrists had been tied behind his back with bailing wire and 75 pounds of iron had been stuffed in his pockets. It hadn't been enough to keep him from floating up from the bottom of the canal, though. Two weeks later, his body was identified by his brother, Bob McLaughlin, who was president of the Chicago Checker Cab Company. He'd taken over the office from Joe Workwell, who had run into a nasty accident while running for re-election. He'd been shot in the head. Before he died, he named Red McLaughlin as his attacker, a lead that was ignored by the police. A mournful Bob McLaughlin spoke to reporters after the grim task of identifying his brother's corpse. He said, A better kid never lived. He was friendly with all the boys. The West Side Outfit, the North Siders, and the bunch on the South Side. Capone, too. I don't know. I don't know. Red McLaughlin was just another casualty of the wars over territory in Chicago in the waning days of Prohibition the identity of his killer remains unknown. If you liked this episode of the podcast, please tell others about it in your Facebook, Twitter, and all the other stuff. I can't express how much I appreciate you doing it and how beneficial it is to the podcast. And if you want to hang out with other listeners of the podcast, you can join our Weirdos Facebook group, which is really active now. And also, I hold a live listen and chat every Wednesday where we all listen to an episode together and chat about it or chat about anything else that pops into your heads. So hopefully I'll see you this coming Wednesday, 7 p.m. Central Time in the chat room. You can find both the Facebook group and the chat room at WeirdDarkness.com. You can also find the rest of our social media, audiobooks I've narrated, the Weird Darkness store, and more on the website. And you can drop me an email from the contact page. If you're listening via Apple Podcasts, I would love to read a review from you. I got an Apple Podcast review from Patir saying, Love it! Amazing, but sometimes the guy's voice makes me fall asleep halfway through an episode. <laughs> okay, is the sort of a compliment yet slap at the same time. That's okay. I understand, Patir, and I, uh, I appreciate you listening regardless of whether or not you're uh, sleeping or awake. I uh, also got a nice uh, comment from uh, Mutilated Matt, an Apple Podcast review, saying, Creepy Pasta Thursday. Great podcast, but what happened to Creepy Pasta Thursday? I've grown to look forward to the stories. Thanks for all your hard work, and I hope you bring back Creepy Pasta Thursday. Well, Matt, um, Due to a variety of reasons, I just couldn't get a podcast uploaded last Thursday, so I opted to post one on Friday instead, and being Friday, it was no longer Creepypasta Thursday. That's that's why you didn't get one last week, but I have not dropped Creepypasta Thursdays. The plan is to be back on schedule with them 
this week. So it's you know it's actually good to know that uh, not only do some people like the creepy pasta episodes, but they're actually missed if they're not posted. So that really is a compliment. So thank you. Do you have a dark tale to tell? You can click on Tell Your Story at WeirdDarkness.com and I might use it in a future episode. All stories in this episode are purported to be true, and they were all written by Troy Taylor. You can find source links to the stories, the books, and the author in the show notes. This episode of Weird Darkness is brought to you by The Option Line. When a young woman is in a crisis pregnancy situation, the first person she opens up to about it will have the greatest impact on whether she chooses life or not for the unborn child. Well, thankfully, the option line is available 24-7. They'll connect the woman immediately to people near her so she won't feel alone or feel so hopeless that she ends her baby's life through abortion. Every 45 seconds, another young woman calls the option line for help. So it's vitally important that we do what we can to keep the option line open. But we need your help to do that. So please, make a one-time gift of $75 that keeps the option line open for another hour another hour to save an innocent baby and bring another frightened young woman some hope. You can call 800-999-7408 right now to make your donation. That's 800-999-7408. Or you can give online at saveababynow.com. That's saveababynow.com. Or you can give at weirddarkness.com slash hope. Weird Darkness is a registered trademark of Marlar House Productions. Copyright Marlar House Productions 2019. If you or your company are in need of a professional voice actor, I'd love to be considered. You can hear some of my voice work at MarlarHouse.com. And now that we're coming out of the dark, I'll leave you with a little light. Psalm 33 verse 4. For the word of the Lord is right and true. He is faithful in all he does. And a final thought. Always find a reason to laugh. It may not add years to your life, but it will surely add life to your years. I'm your creator and host, Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness.